Imagine that there would be a material that's 10 times stronger than steel, highly extendable, and at the same time biodegradable. How would it change our everyday life and world that we see around us? And you know, what's the most surprising thing? You have not only heard about this material or seen it, but every one of you have touched it. And this material is spider silk. Spider silk has been known for humans already for decades due to its extremely tremendous performance. And it surpasses even Kevlar, the material from which currently bulletproof vests are made. If we could make a bulletproof vest from spider silk, that would stop a bullet that's 10 times heavier than the one that bulletproof vest made from Kevlar stops. So it seems that this guy, uh, who is the cause for one of the most common phobias in the world, can teach us something very useful. But why? While knowing about its tremendous properties, its high performance, we don't use it, though it's next to us in nature. So the reason for this apparent nonsense is that we don't know how to produce spider silk artificially. But why should we produce this material artificially? Can't we just farm spiders as we do with silkworms? Well, of course, we could farm a couple of spiders or minor community. But the thing is that spiders, like we Northern Europeans, are not the most social animals. Actually, they have quite strict demands for private space. And when two spiders meet each other, their encounter ends with one of them being consumed up for lunch. So, as you have already probably anticipated, I form part of a team that studies how to produce spider silk artificially. And if we could understand how spiders do it, we could do it as well. So many people think that we can't produce spider silk artificially because we don't know its chemical composition. But actually, we do. And it doesn't differ very much from the one of the silk made by silkworms, silkworms for example. So, and it's totally the same, but what are the reasons for them? Different performances of these two silks. Well, probably you know that the same atoms could arrange in different order and make different molecules. And this is the case with these two silks. They are made from different molecules, though the atoms are the same. It's like in music. You can make two totally different pieces of music using the same notes. But these two molecules, they have something still more in common, not just the atoms from which they are made. They are from a class known as proteins. And proteins, they are amazing molecules. They perform a lot of tasks in our organisms. So, for example, our muscles are made from proteins, and I guess the first thing that comes to your mind, many of you to your mind, that when you hear the word protein, is this thing. <laughs> and truly, yeah, many people use it to increase their mass of muscles. But that's not the only function of proteins. For example, ensure the sense of vision, or they transport oxygen through our blood, this protein is called hemoglobin, or many other functions. Actually, they are around 20,000 different kinds of proteins, each associated with, with its own specific function. So, okay, the proteins are made from the same building blocks. And you know what's more interesting is that the function of our DNA is to define which amino acids these building blocks should be assembled and in what order to make a specific protein. The DNA, it consists of a basis and each three base combinations codes for one amino acid, this building block of a protein. And the next three bases codes for the next one, next three for another one, and so till the whole protein is made. So you probably have learned this in your high school biology classes, though I'm not so sure how much you remember of it. This is known also as a universal language because this translation the way how it's, this genetic code is translated from a code of bases to a language of amino acids does not change throughout all the organisms. It means that you, if you take a genetic code encoding specific protein from one organism and transfer it to a different organism, 
the protein that will be made will be exactly the same. So when, with what scientists started when they wanted to produce spider silk was to take genetic code that encodes the protein from which spider silk is made and to transfer it to another organism so that functioned as a small protein factories. The idea was, so yeah, we can get rid of spiders because they just cause problems. So, and then after they get this protein, they assembled it in fibers. And you could think, well, it was all it takes. So I would like it would be the, as well like that. But actually, I should disappoint you because the fibers that were obtained in this way showed much like inferior mechanical properties than the natural ones. Why so? What does it mean? So it means that the ultimate key in producing spider silk is not hidden in production of the molecules from which is made, but in knowledge how to assemble these molecules in the same way as spiders do. And this has been the enterprise that I have been undertaking for the last couple of years to understand how spiders do it. And we call this learning from spiders. So spiders to produce silk, they have specialized gland. Actually, they have up to seven glands, in each of which are made different kind of silk. Each of these silks have specific function. For example, one is used for making main scaffold of the web, another for a catching spiral, and another one for wrapping prey. So although in each silk gland there is different kind of silk, they all have common architecture. They consist of a storage sack where a solution of these proteins are stored, and then there is a funnel and a duct that connects this gland to the outer environment. So what we know now is that the duct is the key player in production of spider silk. It's the place where silk really is made. When spider pushes the solution of proteins, so kind of liquid, through this duct, and there, all the key steps happen. So firstly, the water is removed, proteins change shape, they come together, and finally, this solid fiber is formed. So you know, this process actually could happen with a speed of one meter of fiber produced per second. So it's kind of amazing thing that's going on in spider. But the devil is in the details. We needed to understand really all the things going on in this gland. So what we did was to measure different kind of chemical conditions in the gland, like acidity, salt concentrations of different kind of salts, pressure of carbon dioxide, and many of others. So we did it all the points around the sealed gland. And here is with what we came up. I guess it looks pretty complicated to you. <laughs> and you could ask, well, why at all it's important? Well, bother about, so. so the answer is actually that just a pure passage through every kind of funnel of these proteins doesn't produce silk fiber. You need to assemble these proteins in very specific manner that they form very specific interactions between themselves. As you see, this is pretty complicated stuff going on there. It's more even complicated to mimic this process, and you need to understand which are the really essential parts and which could be actually discarded. Now you could ask, and actually I have this question all the time asked to me, are we there? Are we there like small kids going in a car? And I should answer to you actually that not yet really. But we have spun fibers with quite fair mechanical properties. They are still kind of inferior to the natural ones. So, and what we are doing now is to understand as I said, which steps are really essential and which can be discarded, and how to these, each of these steps, different parts of this molecule that forms spider silk reacts. So we use broad variety of techniques like nuclear magnetic resonance, X-ray crystallography, and many other techniques that allow us to study uh, molecules in atomic level. That means to see that how atoms are arranged in the molecules and to draw conclusions, how they interact between themselves and how they assemble into this solid fiber. So, and now I would like to give you kind of a homework. 
think about the applications of spider silk, because soon you will have it in your hands, and we will have to make good use of it. Thank you.